Good evening. You're with the news tonight, your daily roundup of all that has happened across India and the world. I'm Ishan Russell, and these are the headlines we're tracking right now. India reiterates support for old friend Russia, says will not support any kind of sanctions against the country. The Prime Minister condemns Friday's terror attacks in Jammu and Kashmir, says it was an attack on democracy. Al-Qaeda militants in Yemen killed US journalist Luke Summers during a failed rescue bid. Barack Obama condemns the murder, calling it barbaric. And the Pakistani army guns down a top Al-Qaeda operative during a military operation. Sukri Juma was indicted by a US court earlier. Well, a top story tonight. Just days before Russian President Vladimir Putin's India, India visit, the government has sent out a clear signal that it will not support any kind of sanctions imposed on Russia by the West. Now, this comes even as the US has warned that by doing business with Russia at this juncture is not a good idea. Setting the tempo for Russian President Vladimir Putin's two-day India visit next week, the External Affairs Ministry has made it clear that India cannot be party to any economic sanctions against its old friend. India has said clearly that it cannot be party to any economic sanctions against Russia. We have an identity or similarity of views with Russia on important global issues, including on the threats from terrorism, particularly in our shared neighborhood, on uh, multipolarity is an important element in the global architecture. Putin will be in India on 10th and 11th of December for the 15th annual India-Russia summit. During the visit, he will hold bilateral talks with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The two leaders are expected to spell out a joint vision of their relationship for the next 10 years, which will provide a roadmap to advancing the partnership to qualitatively new levels. As many as 15 agreements, including some with private entities, will be inked during the summit that will also focus on ways to boost trade. The United States, however, warns that now is not the right time to do business with Russia. Russia, on the other hand, continues to shrug off the sanctions imposed on it by the West. The Russian government has accused the US of imposing asymmetric sanctions. The United States, which has trade with Russia, uh, by far, uh, they are buying, for example, the, the engines for uh, their satellite launchers. Uh, most of the Boeings are built uh, out of Titan produced in the Russian Federation, as most of the software for the, for the Boeing Corporation is produced in Russia. Putin's visit comes just weeks before Barack Obama is scheduled to come to India. At a time when tensions have soared between Russia and the US, India faces a daunting task of balancing its relations with the two superpowers. With Akhilesh Suman, Bureau Inputs, Rajya Sabha TV. All right, to shed perspective on the story, we're joined by Ambassador Rajiv Sikri. Uh, he's, of course, a career diplomat with over 30 years of uh, diplomatic experience and has served in many capacities, including the political counsellor in Moscow, uh, one of those. Sir. So, uh, given the light, uh, given the fact that India and Russia have been long-standing friends and the ties have been uh, there for some time, do you think, uh, I mean, this reiteration by India is uh, absolutely uh, in line with what India has been saying all along? And how do you think the Ameri india american relationship gets a affected by it or does it? I think we should bear in mind that uh, on issues uh, that have mattered to India, like uh, Kashmir, like Goa, Bangladesh war, uh, we got uh, Soviet and then Russian uh, political diplomatic uh, uh, support. Now in the case of Ukraine, this is a matter which matters hugely to Russia. And I think it's only appropriate that we should reciprocate uh, that support which we have traditionally got from uh, Russia on matters of interest to us. So I think that we have done the right thing first earlier when the crisis broke out and right. now in, um, in, in making it clear that we are against sanctions. We have always said that we are against any sanctions that are not supported by the UN Security uh, Council. I think that uh, uh, we uh, should not be uh, concerned about uh, the possible impact on 
Indo US relations. Right, but uh, President India Barack Obama, Ambassador Sikri, uh, President Barack Obama is our chief guest on the 26th importance. of January. So, I mean, given the, the fact that. Uh, the, that's all right. Hmm. No, 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 that's all right. But, you know, I mean, we are not a banana republic, you know. We have our own interests. The Americans don't always do things that suit us. Right. So I think that there is, a, it's not a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. India is also a major player. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, uh, serious interests with Russia in the political, uh, diplomatic, uh, uh, military, uh, energy sectors. So uh, these cannot be ignored. We certainly, we, we have done well to build new friendships with the uh, United States and other countries. But uh, we should not, and I'm glad that we are not following that policy, we should not uh, forget old friends like Russia. All right, so uh, final question to you, Ambassador Sikri. Uh, what do you make of this in terms of, I mean, uh, as far as India and Russia are concerned, uh, this is a new uh, chapter in our history? Or do you see, uh, will, will you wait and watch as to what exactly Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Putin have to actually come out with, uh, with in terms of final deliverables? I think uh, uh, India-Russia relations have always been on an even keel and there is uh, across the board uh, support for closer India-Russia ties uh, uh, among all our political parties. No matter who has been in power, there has been that uh, thing. So Mr. Modi is carrying forward the uh, dynamism that has been there in India-Russia relations, the, the goodwill. Uh, that has existed uh, is, is, is carrying it forward. I think that uh, uh, there will be an effort to uh, in, impart some, uh, some symbolic uh, gestures also because right. uh, perhaps Russia has had a feeling that over the last six months of this government that perhaps India has not paid sufficient attention to Russia. There haven't been uh, the kind of high-level exchanges with Russia that we have had with all the principal partners, including uh, USA, Japan, China, right. Australia, and, and, and so forth. So uh, I think that uh, it's important to reassure Russia that uh, we, uh, we, we consider our relations with them uh, very important. In fact, we have a strategic partnerships with many countries, but with right. Russia, uh, it is a special and privileged uh, partnership. And I'm sure that the outcome of this visit, which uh, has been uh, hinted at by the spokesperson of the MEA, mm -hmm. uh, will, will justify uh, the uh, hopes that have been uh, uh, placed there. I think that we are right. likely to see some advancement in the energy sector, mm -hmm. uh, in the defense sector. All right. uh, uh, and uh, what is really needed is uh, uh, more economic uh, activity between India and Russia, because that is the weak uh, point of the relationship. All right, as uh, well as people-to-people we, people, uh, ties. All right, people so I to, hope that the two leaders will uh, will focus on this during all, their. Time. All right, we we'll leave it. We we'll leave it at that, Ambassador Sikri. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your, your valuable knowledge uh, on Indo-Russian ties and uh, its global impact, including on America, with us. Thank you so much for coming in. Well, moving on now, the Prime Minister and the Army Chief have come out echoing each other today, terming yesterday's terror attacks in Jammu and Kashmir as an attempt to disrupt the election process. 21 people, including eight soldiers, were killed on Friday in one of the worst attacks in the valley in recent times. Reeds were laid on coffins of the martyred soldiers today in Srinagar. A day after the valley shook with four coordinated terrorist strikes, it was a somber day at Badami Bagh Cantonment in Srinagar. Eight army men were martyred in the attack at an artillery camp in Uri sector on Friday. It was time to bid tearful farewell to those who laid down their lives. The four terror strikes are seen as an attempt to disrupt the ongoing assembly elections, which has seen record turnout so far. The army chief ensured that his team is well prepared for the challenge. Kal Kashmir mein aatankvadiyon ne Bharat ke lok tantra par. हमला करने का निर्लज प्रयास किया मैं वीर शहीद संकल्प कुमार 
और शहीद हुए सभी जवानों के प्रति भारत मां के इन वीर सपूतों के प्रति आदर पूर्वक श्रद्धांजलि अर्पित करता हूं The Prime Minister will be back in the state on Monday to campaign for BJP. Security has been stepped up massively in the city as well as the other parts of the valley before it goes to polls for the third phase next week. Friday's attacks have been termed as a well-planned coordinated strike. Experts feel the nature of the attacks call for deep introspection. But this perhaps is a higher level of intensity. And if we reconstruct the events, I think it points to the fact that there is now a higher level of training and determination being imparted to such groups, and the linkage with across the border is also something that should call for very deep introspection by India. Meanwhile, there was global condemnation of the Friday's attacks. Now I think it is a heinous act, and I couldn't condemn that in the strongest form. I think we are all proud that so many Kashmiris came out uh, and did take part uh, in the election process. This is a very good sign. They have expressed their will, and some people don't like that. U.S. has condemned what's happening in uh, Jammu Kashmir, sponsored by Pakistan. It's an eye opener for Pakistan. Today, the international world almost has come to the front where it says that Pakistan is a terror state. Three more phases of elections are yet to be held in Jammu and Kashmir. It remains to be seen if the attacks would impact the encouraging turnout figures it has shown initially. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi returned to Jharkhand today to resume his campaign trail for the third phase of polling there. Addressing a rally in Hazaribagh, Prime Minister once again pitched for development in the tribal-dominated state. He also called upon voters to end the era of coalition governments for better governance. With a third phase of polls just three days away, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is back on campaign trail. He was in Hazaribagh on Saturday addressing a huge rally. He urged people of the state to vote for development of the state, which is full of natural resources. He said, Jharkhand has the potential to attract migrants from across the country if it is economically developed. Itana, Sampanna Pradesh, Paramatma ne Jharkhand ko itana diya hai, itana diya hai, itana diya hai. ये पूरे हिंदुस्तान का जेब भर सकता है इतनी ताकत झारखंड के पास झारखंड झारखंड एक मामूली राज्य नहीं है भाई झारखंड ये हिंदुस्तान के और राज्यों की बराबरी वाला राज्य नहीं है ये झारखंड हिंदुस्तान की आर्थिक प्रगति का शिलो राज्य बनने की ताकत रखने वाला राज्य है he also took on the ruling JMM government on corruption in his speech. He also called upon the voters to put an end to politics of caste and the era of coalition politics to get better governance. Jati Vat ki Rajaniti bhoat ho chuki. Apne paraye ki Rajaniti bhoat ho chuki. Shahar aur gaon ki Rajaniti bhoat ho chuki. अगड़े और पिछड़े की राजनीति भी बहुत हो चुकी अब समय की मांग है ये सारे रास्ते हम छोड़े एक ही रास्ता पकड़े अगर राजनीति करनी है तो विकास की राजनीति करेंगे पीएम ऑल्सो एक्सटेंडेड हिज कंडोलेंसेस टू लेफ्टिनेंट कर्नल संकल्प कुमार शुक्ला a jawan from jharkhand who was also killed during the terrorist attack in uri on friday he condemned the terrorist strikes as attack on the democracy even jharkhand is facing poll boycott threats from maoists the state is alert to any attempts by the maoists to disrupt the polling process after friday's attack in jammu and kashmir security at the rally site in hazaribagh was tightened for the prime minister bureau report rajya sabha tv and Congress President, Vice President Rahul Gandhi was also in Jharkhand today addressing two rallies in the state for the third phase of polls. Rahul Gandhi launched a scathing attack on some of the policies of the central government. He was particularly critical of uh, the Modi government's unfulfilled promises as he claimed in the last six months. <laughs> 
Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi led his party's campaign in Jharkhand on Saturday. He was in Ranchi and Ramgarh addressing two rallies. More than the ruling JMM, Rahul's speeches were directed towards the BJP, which is riding on the Prime Minister's image to return to power in Jharkhand. Stepping up his party's rhetoric against the Modi government, Rahul Gandhi slammed some of the policies adopted by the Prime Minister since he took charge six months ago. आपके बैंक अकाउंट में काला धन आया एक रुपया मिला आपको अच्छा छोड़ो आपके बैंक अकाउंट को छोड़ो हिंदुस्तान में एक रुपया आया आप वही ना नरेंद्र मोदी जी कहते भैया ये तो हमारी बस की नहीं है ये तो हम कर नहीं सकते Rahul Gandhi said the assembly election is a fight between the Congress and the BJP's ideologies. He emphasized on the Congress's contribution in the past to highlight the difference. एक तरफ हम फॉरेस्ट राइट बिल ला रहे हैं, पैसा लाए, वन उपज के लिए एमएसपी लाए, मनरेगा लाए, आपको अधिकार दिया, और दूसरे तरफ हमारे प्रधानमंत्री जी हैं जो कहते हैं इस सब काम से हिंदुस्तान का कोई फायदा नहीं होगा, वो भाषण में आप के पास आते हैं और आपसे कहते हैं देखो पूरी की पूरी शक्ति मुझे दे दो और मैं हिंदुस्तान को बदल दूंगा Congress was in power in Jharkhand until it decided to split with JMM days before the polls were announced. The party hopes to be a part of the government again if the newly formed Samajwadi Janata Dal comes to power. After back-to-back -back drubbings in Lok Sabha polls and two assembly elections, Congress is desperate for some sort of turnaround this time. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Time now for all the other national news and updates. This is Nationwide. Today is the 22nd anniversary of the Babri Masjid demolition. Security was beefed up in Ayodhya as the day passed off peacefully. Nearly 10,000 security personnel were deployed to tackle any untoward incident. Prohibitory orders under Section 144 of the IPC were also clamped. The National Investigating Agency claims to have arrested the key suspect in the Burdwa blast case. Shanur Alam was arrested from Assam today. Alam is alleged to be the financial brain of the Jamaat Mujahideen Bangladesh terror group. A 10-year-old child was killed after a bomb exploded outside the DAV college in Rurki in Uttarakhand. According to the police, the child might have picked up the dormant bomb that exploded later. No further information has been released by the police as they are still investigating the matter. Well, time for a quick break right now, but uh, coming up on the other side, all the international news. Welcome back here with the news tonight and some international news now. Well, U.S. journalist Luke Summers and South African teacher Pierre Korki have been killed by Al-Qaeda militants in Yemen during a failed rescue bid. The two were apparently shot by the captors as the raid unfolded. Summers was badly wounded when the U.S. forces reached him. U.S. President Barack Obama condemned Summers' death, calling it a barbaric murder. The details of the operation remain classified, so there's a limit to what I can discuss here. The overriding concern for Mr. Summers' safety and the safety of U.S. forces who undertake these missions made it imperative that we not disclose information related to Mr. Summers' captivity and the attempted rescue. Hardly 48 hours back, U.S. had admitted to the failed mission to rescue abducted 33-year-old U.S. journalist Luke Sommers. He was being held by militants from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, regarded by the U.S. as one of the deadliest offshoots of Al-Qaeda. Little did they know what lay in store for the U.K.-born Sommers in Al-Qaeda's captivity. There was threat that he will be killed and Sommers knew it. I am certain that my life is in danger. So as I sit here now, I ask, if anything can be done, please let it be done. Thank you very much. محتجز لدينا سيلاقي مصيره المحتوم كما أننا نحذر أوباما والحكومة الأمريكية من مغبة إقدامهم على أي حماقات أخرى. Somers was shot down along with a South African teacher, Pierre Corky. According to U.S. officials, Somers was apparently shot by his captors as the raid unfolded and was badly wounded when the U.S. forces reached him. By the time he was flown to a U.S. naval ship in the region, he had died from his injuries. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV.
Now, America erupted in protest for a third day as demonstrations were held across a host of cities, including the capital, Washington, D.C., and New York City. Protesters held sit-ins and marches as they voiced their anger against the killing of a black unarmed men by white police officers. It has to stop today. No more police brutality. It's not really about race. It's about equality and, and, the, and the social justice system. The system is flawed. We need to fix it. It can happen to anybody. Francis Brathwaite giving voice to what is going on in everyone's mind. Braving the cold, thousands took to the streets of New York on Friday on a third day of demonstrations against police violence. The protests that have come to be known by its slogan, I can't breathe, have been largely peaceful, albeit angry. The slogan refers to the chokehold death of 43-year-old unarmed black man Eric Garner in July. But the protests symbolize a larger outpouring of anger against racist killings. Fighting against this establishment that's been killing my children, my, my family. These people, this NYPD pig have got to stop. They have given them way too much power. We are protesting Eric Garner, Mike Brown, many of the injustices that have been committed. And we need some justice. We need people to pay attention. We can't have business as usual. And New Yorkers are not alone. Protests also happened in Washington, D.C. Dozens took to the streets of the national capital protesting police violence as grand juries in both New York and Missouri decided not to indict police officers in the deaths of unarmed black men. The protesters gathered and staged a symbolic die-in. Jefferson City in Missouri, Boston in Massachusetts, Houston in Texas, Chicago in Illinois, all joined in. I can't I can't I can't the protesters all believe in equality and rue the fact that it has taken four black lives for people to become focused. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. In a major breakthrough, Pakistani soldiers shot dead a top Al-Qaeda operative during an operation on a militant hideout on Saturday. Adnan El Shukri Juma was killed by the Pakistan army in an early morning raid in Shinwarsak region of South Waziristan. According to the Pak Army, Shukri Juma was named in a U.S. federal indictment as a conspirator in the case against three men accused of plotting suicide bomb attacks on the New York subway in 2009. He's also been linked by U.S. authorities to other terror suspects, including a group of men accused of planning to bomb fuel pipelines at New York's JFK airport. During the operation, one soldier was reportedly killed and another was injured. Well, after weeks of maneuvering to find a new leadership for the Pentagon, U.S. President Barack Obama has nominated Ashton Carter as the new defense secretary. Carter served as Chuck Hagel's deputy at the Pentagon before resigning last year. He now returns with a deep knowledge of the vast department that has more than 2 million uniformed and civilian employees and an annual budget of about $600 billion. Carter is expected to face soothe confirmation hearings from Senate Republicans as well. After being overlooked for the top job at Pentagon two years ago, former Deputy Defence Secretary Ashton Carter is all set to replace Chuck Hagel. A beaming Obama introduced him in the Roosevelt Room of the White House, loading him as a reformer and an innovator. As a top member of our Pentagon team for the first five years of my presidency, including his two years as Deputy Secretary, he was at the table in the Situation Room. He is by my side navigating complex security challenges that we were confronting. Uh, I relied on his expertise and I relied on his judgment. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, Ash, in your one-year attempt at retirement from public service, you failed miserably. Uh, but I am deeply grateful that you're willing uh, to go back at it. 
A physicist and a national security insider, Carter was overlooked for the same job two years ago when Hegel was appointed as the Pentagon chief. But on Friday, he pledged his most candid strategic advice to the president if elected. I accepted the president's offer to be nominated for Secretary of Defense because of my regard for his leadership. I accepted it because of the seriousness of the strategic challenges we face, but also the bright opportunities that exist for America if we can come together to grab hold of them. And I accepted the offer because of the deep respect and abiding love that Stephanie and I have for our men and women in uniform. Outgoing Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel was conspicuous by his absence, though he issued a statement saying he strongly supported Carter's selection. Carter is said to be a sharp contrast to Hagel. Though he has never served as a uniformed member of the military and never run for elected office, he is believed to have an insider's grasp of how the Pentagon works and wields blunt language to make his point. Analysts believe Carter's nomination will be instrumental in reviving ties with India. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, time now for all the other international news and updates. This is Global Buzz. A Taiwanese hospital has reported admitting a 19-year-old man suspected of being infected with the Ebola virus. The man was quarantined after he showed Ebola-like symptoms, including fever and diarrhea. The hospital conducted tests on the patient early Saturday morning. The Philippines is preparing for Typhoon Hagupit as volunteers and Navy personnel packed relief material in Manila. About half a million people have fled coastal villages and evacuated their homes as the powerful storm approached. With winds of up to 195 km per hour near the center and gusts of up to 215 km per hour, Typhoon Hagupit is expected to hit the eastern or northern Samar provinces earlier on Sunday. Meanwhile, the Weather Bureau said 47 provinces were at risk. Chinese authorities have arrested former domestic security chief Zhu Yongyang, accusing him of charges ranging from accepting bribes to leaking state secrets. Zhu, who is 71 years old, said to, is said to be the highest profile public figure caught in President Xi Jinping's crackdown on corruption. He is also the senior most uh, Chinese official to be steered in a graft scandal since the communists swept to power in 1949. A suspect has been taken into custody by the Michigan police after four people were stabbed aboard an Amtrak train in the small city of Niles. According to the police, none of the victims died. Amtrak said the incident took place on train 364 while it was at the station. The trains run daily between Chicago and Port Huron in Michigan. And time now for all the sports news in Sportsbeat. Australia look forward to get back to competitive cricket after the tragic death of Philip Hughes. Brad Haddon talked about the player's state of mind ahead of the first test against India next week. Haddon is also hopeful of hamstring injured Michael Clark leading the Australians in the test after he joined training at the Adelaide Oval on Saturday. Meanwhile, in the Indian camp, hopes are high about Captain Mahindra Singh Dhoni being able to play the first test. Dhoni is recovering from a fractured thumb. Dhoni would have missed the first test had the series gone ahead of schedule. Dhoni flew to Adelaide to join his teammates on Saturday and will start training on Sunday. The International Automobile Federation held its 2014 prize-giving ceremony in Doha. Mercedes driver Lewis Hamilton was honoured for winning his second Formula One World Championship. Toto Wolff accepted the Constructors' Trophy. Sebastian Ogier of France uh, received his award as World Rally Champion for the second consecutive year with Volkswagen. Well, that's the news tonight. Good night.